Nadim al -Haq. Let me welcome you to the PID webinar. We are very grateful today and very honored to have Bill Easterly, William Easterly, and I think everybody in the developing world knows. Bill has been a great researcher, prolific researcher, very original, as well as an iconoclast in the developing world. So that's saying a lot for an economic researcher. Bill has um, you know, kind of taken on the icons in development and had a successful debate with all of them, as well as done some very good work, path-breaking work in development. So Bill, I must uh, welcome you and thank you for participating with us. I think Pakistan is really, everybody was very keen to listen to you. Everybody tell me, can you please get Bill Easterly? And so this is wonderful to have you. And people who don't know should also know that Bill has been working on Pakistan. He was at the World Bank and has been to Pakistan a few times and written a couple of papers on Pakistan. So it's uh, really great to have you here, Bill. So to begin with, let me ask you, Bill, to give us an overview of a, what, you, what you are currently thinking about. We've read your book, The Elusive Quest. We've read your white man's burden. We've read your book, The Tyranny of Expert, which has knocked us all out for a six as they say in, in, in cricket language, that all experts are now kind of worried after Bill's assault, but nevertheless, a very, very important assault and a much needed assault. Bill, can you give us an idea on your views of development and what's, what you think development policy should be? And especially if you can talk about Pakistan a little bit, how do you think Pakistan should conduct its development policy? Or how do you think Pakistan has evolved in the conduct of development policy since you came here? Bill? Thank you, Nadim. It's really great to be with you all. So let me start with a very uncontroversial <clears throat> kind of obvious statement that institutions are the key to economic development. But this is a pretty widely agreed principle among development economists that institutions are the key to economic development. So what do we mean by institutions? We usually mean something like political and economic freedom or political and economic rights for poor people, by which we mean uh, poor people get their, should have their property rights respected, especially they should have their political rights respected so that they can protest if their economic rights like property rights are violated. So we think of that as being the key to development but then the big question is, do aid agencies themselves respect the political and economic rights of the poor? And here there are some problems that lead us to what we could call the tyranny of experts, experts who do not respect the political and economic rights of the poor. So let me give you an illustration to motivate this. In 2010, the World Bank uh, International Finance Corporation did a project in a district called Mubende, Uganda. It was a forestry project which was designed to replace the subsistence farming that was going on in Mubende with forestry that seemed like a more productive and higher revenue development initiative than subsistence farming. How is this actually implemented? So according to a story that appeared later in the New York Times, what happened was men with guns showed up in Mubende and started shooting the cattle of the farmers in Mubende, started burning down the houses of the farmers in Mubende, and then marched the farmers at gunpoint away from their villages onto poorly, very poor quality refugee camps where they did not have access to farming or essential services. So this is obviously a, a development success as far as uh, increasing the value of the land but it was not a success for the farmers in Mubende. It was a disaster. Now this violation of the farm, violation of the farmers' political and economic rights, this, this trampling on the institutions that we think are the key to development was so, so striking that it did, as I said, appear on the front page of the New York Times in 2011. The British charity Oxfam had uh, documented what had happened and they were the source of the story in the New York Times. So Laura Fresky and I were writing a blog called Aid Watch at the time, and we wrote a blog, a blog post about this 
rights violation. The World Bank actually responded to us immediately on Twitter, and I actually still have a copy. I'm looking right now at a copy of the Twitter post that I still have. The World Bank said, uh, addressed to me, we're taking the allegations seriously and we're looking into it. Our focus is improving people's lives in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa. So the World Bank said they were looking into it. I thought this was great. They were going to investigate how this had happened, what the role of the World Bank itself had been in this violation of, of political and economic rights of the poor farmers in Mubenda, Uganda. And so somewhat mischievously, Laura Freskin and I decided to start a, a clock ticking until the results of the World Bank investigation came in, until they did the investigation that they had promised in the Twitter post. So we started that clock ticking the, the moment we received the Twitter post. And so you might, some of you might want to guess how long did it take till the World Bank did the investigation? How, any, any guesses? How long do you think it took? Uh, some year? of you, yeah, Nadim? Yeah, a year. A year. So, okay, we have Nadim's guess of a year. Anybody else want to guess? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Nadim. So, it actually did take longer than a year. Nadim, sorry, you're, you're right on so many things, but you're not, you're not right on this one. It took actually a lot longer than a year. So, how long did it take until the clock stopped when the investigation finally happened or results were announced? Well, actually, sadly enough, the clock is still ticking today, 10 years later. There never was, the World Bank never did do an investigation into its own role in this tragedy of the violation of political and economic rights of the farmers in Mabinda, Uganda. So this, this really shocked me at the time and kind of motivated uh, me and others to want to write a lot more on the respect for rights of the poor, the forgotten rights of the poor in economic development and aid efforts. And in fact, this is, well, this was an extreme example and it's certainly not typical of all aid projects. Human Rights Watch actually had already documented how uh, a number of World Bank projects were in fact violating political and economic rights. Uh, a group of investigative journalists formed a consortium around this time to document in particular the, the prevalence of forced resettlement in World Bank projects. So this is, was not, it was not typical, but nor was it an isolated example. This seemed to be a pervasive violation of the rights of the poor that was happening in, in aid projects. And I guess what was saddest to me is that there was so little protest throughout the development community about this. So that's it was kind of an indicator. If nothing else, this is an indicator of how little profile the issue of respecting the rights of the poor has in economic development. Even though we think the rights of the poor are the key to economic development, our aid efforts themselves are not respecting the rights of the poor. So of course, when we think of aid and development efforts, we're often thinking of things like Millennium Development Goals. There were uh, targets for things like poverty and uh, infant mortality for the years 20, for the year 2015. Those goals have been resurrected today as a sustainable development goals for the year 2030. Because the original Millennium Development Goals were not met in Africa, they essentially just restated the same goals for 2030. So not only is uh, aid not, not respecting the rights of the poor, it is also this disrespect for the rights of the poor was also not working to achieve development goals like the Sustainable Development Goals or Millennium Development Goals. So, you know, what's going on here? Well, part of the problem is it's just unlikely that top-down planners, the experts and aid agencies have enough incentives to respect the rights of the poor, have enough knowledge and control to reach the intended outcomes. And so, as I said, most of the goals in, for Africa in particular were, were never met and are unlikely to be met in 2030 either. So what kind of alternative is there to this failed top-down planning and aid well, a lot of the successes in, in development are not the result of aid, but are the result of homegrown efforts. So developing countries themselves have been making major political and economic reforms moving towards political and economic freedom. It's unleashed the power of markets and trade, which has had a, a marvelous effect on poverty in the developing world. 
and it's contributed to the spread of democracy in which poor people are asserting their own political, political rights against corruption and dictatorship. Despite the lack of participation of aid in these efforts, there are major successes going on. So for example, freedom to export and trade when political and economic rights are respected opens up a whole world of trade in which poor people can find the cheapest goods possible for them on the world markets and can also find their biggest opp opportunity for themselves to earn income by exporting to world markets. Let me give you some kind of illustrative examples of how unplanned these, these, uh, these homegrown efforts really are. In a trading system, it's often very surprising what is going to succeed to achieve poverty reduction. So a few years ago, some co-authors and I collected a lot of trade data on very specialized exporting categories and also collected data on to which exact markets the exports went to from developing countries. What we found is there is an amazing amount of specialization in very crazy and unplanned products and destinations by developing countries that were generating a lot of poverty reduction. But the, the key takeaway here is just how surprising and unplanned these, these uh, activities were. So for example, Egypt gets a lot of revenue, a lot of export revenue, reducing poverty from something very specific good sent to a specific market. Specifically, Egypt sends ceramic toilets to Italy. Kenya profits from sending cut flowers to the Netherlands, while Ecuador sends cut flowers to Russia. So each country's top specializations by product and by destination uh, account for a lot of their, their revenue from trade. But it, it was, global trade is a very much a homegrown, unplanned effort. It would be very hard to think of World Bank planners deciding that Egyptians should send toilets to Italians and Ecuadorians should send flowers to Russia. So the genius of markets is that they allow uh, poor people to solve their own problems through homegrown economic efforts. In contrast, in aid, when aid is going into environments in which political and economic rights are routinely violated, then aid becomes part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So for example, the US Agency for International Development, one of its big aid initiatives is to send food aid to countries around the world, which is directly intended to reach the Millennium Development Goal and Sustainable Development Goal of ending world hunger. Uh, but two authors, Nathan Nunn and Nancy Chan, have found that food aid on average increases violence in the recipient countries. This is a, was a very striking finding. The problem is that food aid is often in, injected into a system that's based on violence and coercion rather than respecting political and economic rights of the poor. So for example, Somali warlords capture food aid when food aid comes into Somalia. Taliban warlords capture food aid when food aid came into Afghanistan. Then they use the food aid to pay for, for arms for soldiers, uh, to pay for more weapons, to feed more soldiers, which increases violence rather than furthering development. So it's really a bad idea to inject aid into a very unfree system based on brutal coercion like violence or authoritarian governments that tyrannize their own people. If, if that happens, then aid is allied with violent coercive actors that are going to violate the rights of the poor rather than respect the rights of the poor, which as we keep, as we keep agreeing, the rights of the poor are the key to development. So if aid is leading to more rights violations for the poor, it's the opposite of development, it's undeveloping countries. So is aid making any effort to avoid this problem, to, to direct aid to more free societies in which aid will allow poor people to recognize, to achieve their own political and economic rights? Unfortunately not, aid has been going even more in the wrong direction. So another data exercise that, uh, that I did a while ago is to calculate which aid recipients are getting the biggest aid increases. So, I used 2001 as a breakpoint. So looking at annual average aid before 2001 and then annual average aid after 2001, which aid recipients got the biggest in percentage increases in their average annual aid? And the, to, to clarify the results, I sorted countries into the most free to least free using the World Bank's own governance indicators on political and economic freedom. 
So the, I divided them into the aid recipients into quartiles from the, the most free 25% of the world's countries aid recipients to the least free of the aid recipients. The quartile of countries that were the, the most free, in fact, the top three quartiles on freedom in the World Bank indicators. So 75% of the aid recipients that were the most free got only a 35% increase in aid. Well, how much do you think aid increased to the least free countries, to the least free aid recipients in which aid was more likely to lead to violations of the rights of the poor and undevelopment rather than respecting the institutions that lead to development. So sadly, the least free and most violent societies since 2001 among aid recipients have actually achieved a 300% increase in aid. The least free aid recipients have gotten a 300% increase in annual aid, while everyone else, the more free aid recipients, have only gotten a 35% increase in aid. So aid is going even more into the wrong direction of injecting aid into environments like that of Mubinda, Uganda, where aid is just going to lead to more violations of the rights of the poor and less development. So this is a sad fact of aid, recent aid policy. But again, I want to keep stressing that despite all of this, there is still the, the ongoing homegrown efforts of poor countries to achieve their own development, despite the disrespect that aid agencies show for the rights of the poor. So when I mentioned earlier homegrown economic reforms, a good example is Ghana. Ghana, when I first went as a World Bank economist in the mid 1980s, Ghana was a very violent and coercive society. The government, for example, had imposed on cocoa exporters the requirement that they sell their cocoa to a government cocoa marketing board that was paying only 6% of the world price. And so cocoa exporters were basically not, not able to flourish at all because they were forced to deliver their cocoa at such an extortionate price that did not even make a profit on cocoa. The cocoa industry was being progressively destroyed by this government policy, this brutal coercion. And of course, the, uh, the cocoa exporters might have liked to try to smuggle their cocoa into neighboring countries like Cote d'Ivoire, and some of that happened. But that just caused the government to, ration, to, to ratchet up the coercion in fact, the government announced that it would be a death penalty for smuggling. So that brutal combination of coercion and violating the rights of the poor has essentially destroyed the cocoa industry in Ghana that had been the leading producer and exporter of cocoa worldwide and led to negative economic growth in Ghana that just brutally increased poverty in Ghana. But the happy thing about that is that homegrown reforms had already started in the mid 1980s when I first went there as a World Bank economist. And those homegrown reforms succeeded in decontrolling and liberalizing the Ghanaian economy in a way that did respect the rights of poor producers. And so, the, for example, the requirement of the severe controls on cocoa prices and the requirement of selling to a government marketing board, those were discontinued. And the cocoa industry then, then revived. And other examples like this happening around the world in uh, Asia, Latin America, and Africa also led to some of the dismantling of the extreme economic controls that violated the rights of the poor. Things like extremely high inflation, severe controls on interest rates that led to negative real interest rates for poor savers, and, uh, and severe controls on trade that killed off exports and trade. So the, the happy story is that those homegrown economic reforms have actually been quite successful leading to the revival of economic growth in regions like Africa and Latin America and leading to more progress uh, that has happened on world poverty through those homegrown economic reforms. Also, these economic reforms are also supported by politi political reforms. So to use Ghana again as an example, Ghana at the same time as it was reforming economic rights also reformed political rights. So the Ghana became a, a functioning democracy as of the year 2000 and had multiple competitive fair elections since then that allowed the poor to assert their own political and economic rights through a democratic system. And happily, Ghana has had a, a very positive economic return from recovery of economic growth in, in Ghana it has happened as a result of the political and economic freedom that has increasingly been recognized through the homegrown efforts of Ghanaian themselves. 
So I want to leave you with a, you know, bad news and good news. The bad news is aid is not respecting the rights of the poor and is not contributing to development, is, is sometimes undeveloping countries rather than developing them by, by supporting the systematic violation of political and economic rights for the poor. The good news is that poor people themselves are, are asserting their own rights. And then another hopeful indicator that I will leave you with at the end is that there's a, an institute that measures political protests around the world, political democratic protests around the world. And despite the difficulties of democracy in the world right now, one, one indicator is that the poor themselves are fighting for their own democratic rights. The, the indicator of political protests around the world was the highest last year that it has ever been in the history of this indicator, which goes all the way back to 1900. So we can't trust aid experts to respect the rights of the poor, but one group that we can trust to campaign for the rights of the poor are poor people themselves. They are protesting, they're demanding greater political and economic rights. And we can continue to hope that they will be successful so that development of the people, for the people, and by the people does not perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. That's a very good overview of your work, but uh, let me put to you that in keeping with what you said, the World Bank has done a wonderful project in Pakistan called the Neighborhood Project. The World Bank is into developing neighborhoods in Pakistan. So they have a Karachi Neighborhood Project where they have tried to gentrify neighborhoods with the result that there has been uh, street vendors who have been displaced. Now, I think you might want to add that to your list of anecdotes. On thank you, thank you, Nadim. That's a good one. <laughs> the next thing I'd like to ask you is, um, or maybe perhaps raise it in a presentation. I'll ask Fahim Jahangir to make a short presentation on our work on aid. And I want you to comment on the possibility of crowding out of domestic policy by aid agencies. Naeem, can you make your presentation, short presentation? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nadeem. And it's an honor and pleasure having uh, uh, Professor Easterly with us. So I will quickly just show you a few slides uh, to bring the debate on Pakistan. So this is the slide on um, uh, the trend of economic growth in Pakistan. So this slide actually shows the uh, short-lived economic booms and then busts in the economic growth in Pakistan. And in the longer run, if you see, there is a declining trend, uh, which we can see between 1950s and, and today. Uh, due to this, uh, uh, because of the uncertainties and frequent shifts in our uh, policies, we had to actually go to IMF multiple times. And if we count, then we, uh, had these uh, uh, lendings uh, from IMF uh, for 22 times, uh, again, uh, during 1950s and uh, to date, we are also going there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if we, I show you this uh, map, which is uh, uh, I prepared from uh, in, in my PhD work uh, I did on foreign aid. So I call it aid industry. Uh, donors don't like this terminology, but I believe it's a profitable industry. So I call it aid industry. So if you look at Pakistan, then if you see in 2018, we had 34 official bilateral donors. We had 33 multilateral donors, official multilateral donors who were engaged in more than 2000 project activities in Pakistan. Then there are, uh, we don't have exact numbers, but rough numbers shows that uh, there are around 100,000 to 150,000 NGOs, civil society organizations, and international organizations and other contractors who are working in Pakistan. Um, on the government side, we see there are 35 federal ministries. There are 161 provincial departments, autonomous bodies, institutes, and then there are countless other actors who are involved in managing aid policy processes in Pakistan, including the bureaucracy, the the, uh, the large, you know, an army of consultants and you know private think tanks and academia, and everyone out there. And then if you see due to these, uh, the presence uh, of numerous actors in this aid management in Pakistan, there is a multiplicity uh, of aid in Pakistan. This graph is showing the donors activities in Pakistan via government and other channels. So you see if the green uh, color of the bar is showing that the aid uh, activities conducted through the government channels and the yellow bar is showing uh, the activities which uh, donors are conducting 
uh, with the private con contractors or private firms in Pakistan. But interestingly, if you see at the bottom, uh, this is the average project disbursement size of uh, the donor, the bilateral uh, donor agency and multilaterals. If you see that uh, uh, the average project disbursement size is very small. Uh, if you see in the case of Norway, it's only just a 0 0.20 million dollar. And uh, then if you see Canada, uh, they hardly work with uh, the government. They like to work with the private sector and they are, the average disbursement size is uh, 0.13 million dollars. And then finally, if we talk about the donor visits to Pakistan in 2015, uh, uh, if I show you the number, there were 487 donor missions to Pakistan. Uh, and that means uh, there were two donor missions present in Pakistan on every working day on average. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Now, Bill, I used to be the Minister of Planning for about three years. And most of my time in the finance business time was spent working with, um, oh, answering to donors, making presentations to donors. Now the question is, uh, and it's also, for example, let me tell you, most of our laws, for example, this is the third time the IMF revi is revising the central bank independence law. We've had a PFM law written by the donor. We've had regulatory laws written by donor. We've had um, so many laws written by donors. Um, and most of our policy is donor driven. How do you see the policy freedom to a country like Pakistan beset by so many donors? Or does it yeah. not matter? Yeah, it does matter. So, I mean, I'll make one boring point and then one more, more substantive point, which is uh, the boring point is that, you know, you know taking using uh, Fahim's great presentation, that it's, it's obvious that the, part of the problem is every donor to Pakistan is operating in every sector. And so what we see is, a, is an amazing lack of any kind of specialization by donors. You know, we were talking oh, a moment ago about the specialization that happened in global trade that Egypt, Egypt specifies in sending toilets to Italians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'd be optimal for donors to do the same thing, to specialize, especially small donor agencies, to specialize in a few countries and in a few sectors in those countries. So there wouldn't be so much overlap between donor agencies that are tormenting uh, the recipients, the aid recipients, like they were tormenting you, Nadine. That's, that is yet another indicator of how much basic lack of respect for elementary economic principles there is in the aid agency. There's no attempt at specialization that we might have expected if they were just trying to maximize their effectiveness. And then the last boring point, of course, is that this situation leads to a lot of attempts of donors to control and impose what they think is best on the recipient country. And so from what you said, Nadim, that, that's I think part of what you are just very justly complaining about with, with Pakistan. Well, um, there's another thing that I want to get your views on, which I've never quite understood, both on the other side of the fence and here. Well, what is capacity building? <laughs> yeah, anytime there's a kind of a phrase in which the meaning is not is not apparent. It's usually, rep, it's usually some kind of fudging over of of something that's not clearly defined and not working well. And so capacity building is the idea that you that aid could somehow support the the building of, of human capital among uh, a, you know the aid recipients. Uh, and you know in practice, it just means a lot of. <laughs> A lot of you know Western consultants coming in giving training courses that don't that don't meet the needs of people in recipient countries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we have people going to the northern areas of Pakistan, which are very nice touristic places, offering capacity building on peach growing or pear growing or grape growing, which people have been doing for centuries. Now, um, am I, I love missing? That. <laughs> Am I missing something? What's happening? Uh, no, you got it. You got it. <laughs> okay. Turning to another subject. Now, you made a big deal out of planners versus searchers. Okay. What do you mean by planners versus searchers? Well, I think uh, I think we can use the examples we've already talked about to illustrate this. So, planners are those who are trying to, uh, you know, impose their their policies 
and ideas to achieve millennium development goals or sustainable development goals, which in fact they fail, they have failed to achieve and are still failing to achieve. And searches are the kind of activities that we saw in markets where, you know, uh, Ecuador just searched for a profit opportunity and found it kind of unexpectedly in sending flowers to Russia. Uh, you know, while Kenya was sending flowers, sending flowers to the Netherlands. So that that's an example of searchers. Mm -hmm. That uh, we don't have any preconceived notions about what's going to lead to success, and you just want actors who are motivated by having good political and economic incentives to find things that work. That's what a market system does. That's what a democratic system does, in which people can campaign for the public goods, the public goods that are most going to be going to be meeting the needs of the poor. So political economic freedom is what leads to, to productive searching for the best, the best development outcomes. Top-down planning by aid is, is, what, is we mean, what we mean by planning. There are other narratives that seem to kind of uh, plague us. Uh, one narrative is data and evidence. Evidence-based policy is only something that a development consultant comes and tells us through a regression or something. The experience or capacity building, the experience of the poor people, let's say from street vending or growing their crops or whatever, that is not evidence unless it's codified in English by a firm consultant. Um, how would you treat evidence? What is evidence? What do you think is evidence as far as uh, you know, you as a development expert, green policy, et cetera, what is evidence to you? Yeah, well, there are good and bad sides to evidence. Uh, the good side is evidence helps us understand what, what works in development. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the idea that political and economic rights work for development in the long run, that's based on some kinds of evidence that just re re records who has succeeded the most in the long run in development and usually political and economic freedom is involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, the bad kind of evidence is is failing to answer the question, you know, when we say aid works, the question is aid works for whom? You know, who is aid working for? If, for example, the World Bank had gone into Uganda and said, well, we found that our Mugende Uganda project worked because it raised the, the productivity of the land to shift it from subsistence crops to forestry, but obviously it did not work for the Mugende farmers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way evidence is used can itself be kind of a, a cover for violating rights of the poor and failing. Evidence always needs to ask, who is it working for? Who is the supposed evidence-based policy benefiting? And that's what we often fail to do when we just take a purely technocratic approach to evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Let me bring in some questions from the floor. Sarah Nazimani. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Sarna Zamani, and I'm a development economist in making. It's an absolute honor to be able to interact with you today. Uh, I would want to say that if you want to see the bank's ability to hurt the poor, we don't have to go far. Currently, there is an anti-encroachment drive uh, going very aggressively in Karachi, which is our economic hub, where the government uh, is destroying homes in exchange of less than uh, an amount of $2,500, that too has to be paid in two years. Please note that this is a city which is industrial city and a port city, and we need labor. And basically we have no social housing and we're basically destroying home of these people who are running this city. Um, ironically, the bank's environment and social framework, which went into effect in 2018, is basically committed to save people from adverse impact that could rise from the bank's financed projects. So uh, there is no doubt that even if the agencies want to help us, it's difficult for them to help us because they just don't understand. Uh, so my question is that, uh, would you suggest that in order to get real economic growth, do we get rid of aid agencies as a whole? Do we simply refuse to take help? Or do you see the donor uh, donors making themselves accountable uh, better? Do you see that happening? Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, thanks, Sarah. That's a great, great comment and a great question. Uh, you know, I mean, I think it's up to each individual recipient country to decide what to do with aid. And, uh, and you know, in a free system, uh, many 
many people will have a voice on, on that decision. And uh, whether aid can be accountable, you know, that's something I, I thought 20 years ago when I, when I first started writing on aid and commenting, I, I had a hope, and I think many other aid critics had a hope that, uh, that criticism would, would force aid to become more accountable. And I guess I have to say, you know, after 20 years of that, of that effort of aid critics, I think aid critics ourselves, we have failed. <laughs> I have to admit, I have to hold ourselves accountable also that we have failed to increase accountability in the aid agencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, frankly, I, I have sort of given up to try to make aid more accountable. And so I, you know, I, I don't think that aid is going to become more accountable. There doesn't seem to be any response to, to uh, criticism that would make aid more accountable. You know, Bill, in Pakistan, we try and engage the World Bank people who we personally know, and it's very difficult to get them to even come to our platform and listen to our webinars. Yet they yeah. seem to pause on Pakistan. They can't listen to local conferences, local webinars, because they seem to think they're above them and that they know everything. So let me go to uh, Numan Afsal. Numan Afsal. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm Numan. Uh, I'm the chief economist with government of uh, KPK. Um, I wanted to ask the uh, uh, learned professor Bill about um, the efficacy of foreign aid. Actually, uh, our province is one of the smallest provinces and we rely a lot on foreign aid and we have uh, a lot of World Bank projects and uh, uh, Asian Development Bank projects which are working. And most of these projects are good actually. So the recent one is the bus rapid transit project uh, with the assistance of Asian Development Bank, which is going quite successful. Um, I'm, there are a lot of criticism about foreign aid uh, that it's not working. You people call it as dead aid. So, but but my experience has been that these these projects are working quite well, and uh, we do need these resources because if we did not have these resources, we would not have built all these. So, what's your take on this, Professor? You think that foreign aid, uh, if used in properly, can be helpful for the developing nations and smaller provinces like ours? Uh, thanks, Norman, for that, that comment. I'm glad you're injecting a more positive note on, on aid. You know, we do want to try to be, all of us want to try to be very balanced in this, in this debate and acknowledge there are some successes for aid. Aid does succeed sometimes. And, you know, sometimes, the, and even aid planners can achieve some things when, when the, the aid business, when the, the problem that they're trying to solve is more amenable to planning. So, uh, one big success that is often mentioned is on health. As for example, uh, vaccination campaigns have been quite successful in reducing infant mortality, along with things like oral rehydration salts. So, you know, those were efforts that were more amenable to top-down planning. You could do, have a vaccination campaign planned by experts that could achieve some success. Where aid tends to fail is in kind of everything else that is not so amenable to planning and where there is lack of sufficient incentives and accountability to the people that's trying to help. Great, thank you. Um, Beza Nurgul. Beza Nurgul. Yes, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this opportunity to ask questions. I wanted to ask a quick question to Professor Easterly. So it seems that a lot of these issues are about uh, aid not reaching the right hands or right places. And I wanted to ask, what are your comments on how we can try and assure this and more specifically your thoughts about RCTs? There's a growing literature about the economic, the ethical concerns regarding RCTs. But on the other hand, it could be an essential tool to understand how we can use aid most efficiently. So. I wanted to ask your quick opinion on that. Thank you very much, Bill. This is a comment from Turkey. Oh, thanks, thanks, Beza. That's uh, that's a great question. I think um, you know RCTs have been useful in kind of identifying some things that that could directly help the, the aid recipients. So, for example, I, one of the most promising areas in the recent research, I think, is just giving cash grants directly to poor people, and that's been found in RCTs to have quite positive effects. Um, I think the problem with RCTs is that they are themselves not very well designed to respect the rights of the poor. You know, do, 
are the, the results of RCTs made available to poor people after the RCT is done? Does the RCT recommend something, you know, does the RCT just empower some aid, aid expert or government planner to do whatever they want to the poor, or does it really involve a process where the poor themselves are consulted on what's going to happen to them? I think the fundamental idea of good institutions is just that people should have the right to consent to their own development. And unfortunately, RCTs could violate, violate that right. Well, what do you think? I mean, very quickly before I go to the floor again, what is your view on the role of government in development? I mean, this is a subject that we often kind of keep hidden. We really do not discuss it deeply. When you say institutions, what is the role of the government in making institutions? What is the role of the market in making institutions? And secondly, in, in, our, um, in development discourse, we don't pay much attention to fixing government. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, there's this kind of huge government versus markets debate in development. <laughs> and, you know, it's been a very useful debate, that's fine. But I think in some ways, it's kind of the wrong debate. But what we really want should have is kind of a debate on rights or no rights. So rights mean that uh, poor people can make the government accountable to them. And they can also, you know, function in markets in which uh, businesses are accountable to their customers. So rights kind of create accountability in both government and markets of, of governments and corporations made accountable to their to their customers and their constituents. Mm -hmm. And so that the, the debate on rights or no rights, I think it's far more important than the debate on governments versus markets. Okay, great. Thermis Khan. Thermis Khan. Yes, right. yes. Okay. Um, hello, uh, Dr. Easterly. Uh, wonderful to hear I, you speak. Hi, I'm Maurice. Um, I think you've interacted on Twitter before. Yes, okay. yes, we have. Yeah. Yes, we have. Uh, you've yeah. circulated an article of mine. Thanks very much. Thanks for remembering. Yes, I'm calling in from Karachi. And one of the issues that I have been trying to bring up in the discussions on aid is that countries, aid, which are aid receivers in the South, I think it's our responsibility to push back on aid. Because if you talk about aid dependency, um, we have a certain responsibility to play as well. Um, I understand there are issues and there are um, uh, a lot of, um, I think, liabilities that we have and limits that we have as well, which is why we accept aid. But I think there needs to be a pushback from our end as well. And I'm wondering what you think about that, because as uh, Dr. Nadeem have just mentioned, what is the role of governments in their own development? And that's something that I think donors don't necessarily, I mean, they use it as buzzwords, but they don't necessarily actually act on it. Uh, but I think that's something we as countries ourselves have to take over. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that. Oh, well, do you, I agree with you. You've said it much more eloquently than I can. I mean, I think the, the attempt to use aid as kind of a, an instrument itself of coercion, that you will use aid to kind of bribe or extort the, the aid recipient to, to do what the aid experts want instead of what, what people, what economists and political activists and citizens and, and aid recipient countries themselves want. So I, I totally agree with you, Tamris. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I call Huma Kadir? Hi, thank you, Professor, uh, for the session. I have a very simple question. Um, how would you compare? I mean, we're talking about Pakistan. We cannot uh, disassociate uh, China and the CPEC. How would how would you differentiate Chinese foreign assistance compared to that of the developing or of the developed country? So, I know the the nature of the two assistance is different, but can you really uh, differentiate between um, the aid dependency? or the debt trap that both both sides really, uh, you know, attach to the kind of assistance given by the respective parties? That's a great question, Huma. I think the, the, the debt trap itself is kind of a, an indicator that aid is kind of the same everywhere, regardless of whether it's Western aid or Chinese aid. And when, you know, the Western aid resulted in a debt crisis that led to the low-income debt forgiveness program known as the highly indebted poor countries uh, debt relief program, HIPIC. 
and now Ch China Chinese aid looks like it's headed in the same direction of the need for for debt relief and a debt trap. So you know the need for debt relief is itself an indicator of of failure. That when the loans do not generate enough productive revenues, then, it, then it's impossible to repay the loans. And so that just lets us know that that aid is tending to fail, both in the case of Western aid and Chinese aid. And Bill, what do you think of uh, the economic hitman book? Oh, that's an old one. I haven't I haven't heard it. That's yeah. that reference in a long time. Yeah. I thought that was kind of overly, uh, you know, had too much of a weakness for sort of conspiracy theories. So I didn't really, mm. I, I found that went too far. No, I appreciate that. But did it make a point or was it? Uh... It made a point, but I think it, it was not as completely as persuasive as it could have been because it had too much of a fondness for sort of conspiracy theory. Fair enough. Abdul Moeed? Abdul yes, hello. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yes. Uh, yes, well, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you, uh, Mr. Huck, as well as Professor uh, William. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, Abdul -Muid? Yeah. yeah, so my name is Abdul Muid. I'm based in Islamabad, Pakistan. I'm a development professional and a, a development economist uh, by profession. And uh, I had the pleasure of reading your 2006 seminal text, uh, Mr. Easterly, um, you know, The White Man's Burden, and uh, this, this, this entire discussion has brought back sort of lots of uh, heated debates, uh, classroom debates about, you know, the role of searchers versus planners and so forth. And I, I bring up those thoughts because throughout this um, um, conversation, I kept thinking of one primary question, which was, the binary of searchers versus planners, do you see there being something of a middle path? Because when I see, when I hear you talk about, say, um, ceramic workers in Egypt exporting, uh, you know, uh, their wares to Italy or, you know, flower producers in Kenya exporting their wares, you know, to Russia or whatever. Uh, part of me just, you know, the, the macroeconomist in me just takes a step back and goes, okay, but will this scale? And are those uh, what you describe as uh, poverty allevi uh, alleviating effects of these uh, homegrown initiatives, these surprising and unexpected initiatives, really um, meaningful in their larger scheme of things? And will they scale for countries uh, that they originate from? Because these are very poor, large, uh, densely populated countries. And secondly, um, I, I think the, the question regarding, you know, government and development, I think that's important as well, because regardless of whether um, economic reform, home growth. Did we lose you, Moeed? I think we lost it. Go ahead, Bill. You can. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's a great question, Abdul. I think it's uh, the question of scale is a, a good way to talk about uh, development efforts. So. Now, the advantage of global trade is that global trade does scale because you know when uh, when flour producers are successful at yielding a profit by exporting to Russia or the Netherlands, uh, then that profit allows them to scale up their operations further. That the incentives tell them, yes, you can scale up, you should scale up because this is profitable, and the revenues themselves finance the scaling up. And so these are these are not like minor handicraft efforts. These are huge export revenue generators that are directly contributing to the reduction of poverty in places like Kenya and Ethiopia and, and Egypt. So yes, that those do scale. What does not scale as well are aid projects because the aid projects don't have this kind of positive feedback going on. Even when they succeed, it doesn't the success does not lead to a scaling up. It does not generate does not cause the aid agencies to say, oh yes, this is succeeding, let's do a lot more of that. There's no sort of built-in mechanism like there is in trade. Okay, Sajidullah? Sir, thank you so much, Professor Bill, for the, for the lecture. Sir, I want your comment on the role of certain institutions that are linked with the foreign aid in one way or another. For example, the Development Assistance Committee of OECD, whose criteria is widely used for the evaluation of developmental programs, especially in the context of Pakistan. So do they serve as an accountability mayor or do they promote the kind of role that foreign aid is already playing? 
good question. Go ahead. Ben. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think so, so to be fair to donors, they are trying to make some efforts at accountability, they, which shows they understand the issue of accountability. Uh, unfortunately, you know, what we always need to look at as economists and political scientists are what are the incentives? What, where, in what direction are the incentives pointing them? And so I think the problem with accountability has been that the, the fundamental incentives for the Western donors are simply to, you know, do whatever the gov Western governments want because that's where the money, the taxpayer money from Western governments is where, what funds them. So they're gonna reward what the, the funders priorities rather than the recipients priorities. So we think, see things like those numbers that I cited earlier of the gigantic increases in, in aid to the least free countries was mainly reflecting a foreign policy agenda of the US to give uh, aid to allies in the war on terror even when those were allies were very uh, autocratic and corrupt and violent and presiding over a lot of violence such as uh, you know Somalia and Afghanistan and Iraq uh, so that's that's the problem with accountability is you know the incentives do, do not support accountability of donors to the recipients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, Abbas Musfi. Am I audible? Abbas Musfi. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, you are indeed. Go ahead. Um, hi. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, if you'll bear with me for a second here. Um, what are your thoughts on the manner in which certain foundations, uh, particularly in the States, um, for instance, the Jeff Bezos Foundation have in recent years moved away from this culture of micromanaging the projects that they fund, um, for instance, by reducing the frequency of uh, reporting periods and easing, all, easing on the restrictions that NGOs are required to meet, and the idea being that uh, locals are much more aware of what needs to be done and should be granted a sort of leadership role in the process. How effective do you think this is considering the nature of power in most developing countries? And um, my second question, somewhat related to the same, is uh, what do you think is the best way for the developing world to uh, enhance the level of democracy in its countries and get rid of the colonial institutions of yesteryear, you know, institutions that are, that, uh, that both local as well as foreign elites have um, strong incentives to preserve mostly due to the personal benefits that are up for grabs. Thank you so much. Yeah, Abbas, on, on your first question, I think actually it sounds like you know much more about that than I do. It sounds like you're in favor of what Bezos is doing, and it sounds like a good thing. On the uh, on the democratic institutions and sort of the legacy of colonialism, I, I mean, I think that is part of the problem. We have this this mindset that uh, that any degree of political coercion and autocracy and uh, political oppression is justified if it serves the cause of development. And that's a, that's a kind of mind, you know, destructive, counterproductive mindset that was, was really left over from the colonial regimes that uh, especially the British justified their colonial rule as supposedly, uh, you know, supporting the cause of material development. And they, you know, they incorrectly thought that uh, the recipients of their colonial, the, the subjects of their colonial rule did not care about their political rights, that, that they were supposedly grateful for the British colonial development efforts. And I think history shows how mis, misguided and mistaken that was, but it has left a legacy of, of sort of justifying any kind of authoritarian rule in the name of development and, and furthering material development and not caring about political rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, uh, Aziz Ahmed? Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Uh, I'm Aziz Ahmed. I'm teaching uh, actual economics in one of the privileged sector universities in Balochistan. That is the most backward province of Pakistan. My question is related to the graduating countries of uh, uh, regarding SDGs. Uh, what uh, what uh, probability do you see uh, uh, for developing countries uh, to achieve most of the targets of SDGs by 2030. Since uh, the last report by UNDP that was launched, only three to four countries were actually mentioned is graduating from 2014 to 2020. However, most of the countries are actually lagging behind, uh, especially in the case of inequalities. Inequalities has increased actually regarding all these, uh, you know, that uh, 169 sub target of the SDGs. Uh, what is actually the probability for all the countries to achieve most of the 169 targets by 2030? 
Thank you. Yeah, well, um, you know, economists should never be trusted to prophesy anything correctly, to forecast anything correctly. So I, we don't know what's going to happen with the SDGs. I think, you know, for me, what was uh, disappointing is that the previous development goals effort, the Millennium Development Goals, which were announced in the year 2000 and they meant to be achieved by 2015, you know, when those failed, there was no kind of accountability or, or you know, a review of what had happened to lead to the failure of those, of those goals, the approach of those goals. So I think the same approach of sort of top-down planning, technocratic efforts that do not respect rights of the poor continued from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm not, not very optimistic about the, those efforts, you know, succeeding now when they have failed so many times in the past. Yeah, if I could continue the next question, if you could allow me. Uh, is there any, yes, is there any synchronized, uh, uh, you know, that level or type of policy options given by UNDP or, uh, you know, that uh, the SDGs uh, proponents to give to the countries to achieve all these goals? Yes. Um, you're asking, is UNDP sort of recognizing uh, sort of homegrown efforts to achieve those goals? Is that is that your question? Oh, I think you're saying any synchronized effort by the UNDP. Yes, synchronized efforts. Oh, synchronized. Any... Yes. Yes. Well, you know the the problem with synchronizing is uh, is kind of undermined by by what uh, uh, the pre the great presentation that we saw in, in this session about how fragmented aid to Pakistan is and how there are so many so many NGOs and official aid agencies that are not coordinating their efforts. So there's kind of a spectacular lack of synchronization that was dramatized for, for Pakistan. It's very characteristic of other aid recipients as well. When there are so many actors with so many different agendas, the hope of synchronizing is pretty pretty dismal. Yeah. Dr. Shanaz Khan. Uh, my question, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. You can hear you, go ahead. Okay, so my question is, um, you know, you gave example of uh, Ghana. Um, do you, are there any studies where that actually improve the poverty level, uh, number one? And number two, uh, some questions came about, you know, were about uh, Chinese aid to uh, the, I mean, the CPAC. Now that's a loan. So uh, when you say aid, uh, exactly what is the definition of that? Uh, so, your, so your question is, what is the definition of aid? And I'm sorry, what's the other part of your question? Um, is there any, uh, are there any studies where uh, poverty was reduced in the countries you mentioned, uh, like uh, flour export and cocoa in uh, Ghana? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think there's there's a strong correlation between poverty reduction and expansion of trade in poor countries, and there's a strong correlation between you know economic growth in general and poverty reduction in poor countries. Now that does so I think most of the time, economic gr growth and uh, globalization and expansion of trade is is successful at reducing poverty. Now that doesn't mean that uh, you know GDP increases by themselves are enough to justify whatever is. The policy is because again we always have to ask who benefits, who is, who is benefiting. So we need to consider income distribution as well as overall growth. We need to consider whether any rights are being violated, as we've talked about today. But in you know the big picture is that uh, trade and GDP growth are are gigantic engines to drive poverty reduction. Great, China Nisa. Hi, Bill. I know you very well because um, I used to be a macroeconomist once upon a time at the World Bank uh, as a consultant, and I worked uh, mostly in ECA during those days. Uh, I had opportunities nice to, to work. Nice to hear from you yes. again. I used to be Shahina Khan at that time, if you remember. I don't know. But um, now I'm Shahina Nisar. Um, just to let you know that I am now wearing different lenses. And the reason I'm wearing different lenses uh, is 
I've gained a lot of knowledge from other sectors and the way the bank works. My, I think I would, to the whole, I mean, everybody here, all participants, I would like to request that, you know, it is not fair to talk about the World Bank or IMF as donors. Donor agencies, and I've also worked on those, you know, like, you know, I've, I've heard your conversation and you were talking about, you know, how aid, it's not typically an aid in the typical way that it is taken. Um, there are a lot of conditions. There are a lot of agreements. There's a lot of preparation for the, uh, for, uh, for the feasibility of the projects in different areas. And then, you know, a lot of assessment and a lot of partnership and a lot of, uh, you know, and over time I have learned a lot. So I would like to bring those little, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, I, I fully agree that what you are saying, your data is definitely telling you, and it, the, when free lunch is there, naturally there will be more, it will be more correlated with a lot of riots uh, and, you know, uh, the smugglers would want to, you know, take their share and stuff like that. And in the forestry sector, I can expect that this would happen because forestry sector is very much prone to all those things. Regarding Thanks. SDGs and capacity building and all that aspects, I, for example, I'm just going to give you an example of one of the projects uh, in Kabul, which, where I wrote an ICR. And um, I was thrilled to see that, you know, the, 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 the project management unit had built their capacity and the project was extended, but the project management unit had a foreign consultant hired. They ha the, the government hired a, fire, a foreign consultant to lead the project, and it was a rehabilitation project. When I went, when the project closed, when I went there, I didn't see the project consultant. His term had expired. Um, they had a lot of money. But these boys in project management unit and the manager, I was pretty impressed by them because they learned it from the this. So can you me off? Okay, okay, sorry. So I, I do, do see that there's a lot of disconnect. First of all, I would like to request people not to take the World Bank and IMF as donors. Donor agencies are also different and aid is different. There are different terms and conditions and that is an important, uh, you know, uh, I, I would really like to underscore that. So, I mean, I don't think we have much time, but, you know, I have learned a lot and regarding SDGs, every sector has its own, uh, you know, a target and they are doing it with respect to the country conditions and all that. And we definitely need uh, money to move forward. You know, a child needs education for education, the, the child needs a loan not a grant, because if it's a loan and there's a repaying uh, condition, then the child would work hard and, you know, do very well. I'm sorry, I mean, I can go on, but I'm... No, no, please, we'll hold a separate session with you. Bill, you want to say anything or...? Uh, thanks, Shahina. I mean, I think you're, um, you're illustrating something that we could call the, the micro-macro paradox, that there's, there are some successes at the project level in, in aid and the favorable things that you noticed. Uh, and you gave an, a project in Kabul as an example. So yes, there are some successes in projects in, in Afghanistan. Of course, the big, the macro picture in Afghanistan is an enormous failure of uh, attempts at development and nation building in, in Afghanistan. And so that's that's been a well-known paradox, which is just illustrating that even when there are successes at the project level, it's still very hard to make aid succeed at the country level. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Basharat Saeed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem and, and Dr. Easterly. Uh, so my question is going back to the discussion on the rights of people, their property and social rights being violated. Uh, and someone gave the example of the ongoing anti-encroachment drives in Karachi. Just wanted to uh, point out something and then ask a question. Just wanted to point out that the anti-encroachment drives are very much a representation of not just this government, but previous government's approach towards the issue of 
uh, informal settlements and and urban sprawl. Uh, and uh, you, you're right, there's, there's lots of people have found themselves being uh, involuntarily displaced uh, uh, as, as you know, to make way for, for construction. And it's not just, you know, you know projects that might or might not be foreign funded, it's local real estate developers, some foreign investment, the military is also involved in you know, real, real estate development, which comes at that cost. So my question, Dr. Easterly, is in a situation where the government, with or without donor funding, um, cannot be trusted to uphold these rights that you consider sacred, uh, do you think the, the donor agencies such as the World Bank or Asian Development Bank that might have some leverage have a higher moral responsibility to maybe nudge or uh, to use your term, coerce the government? Where do you draw the line? Because just because you and I think it's a benevolent you know, cause, it is still coercion. It, it is some people would still see as technically and ideologically as a violation of the sovereignty of the state. So do you find it easy to draw that line or do you not draw that line at all? Do you think any sort of influence by donors on government is a violation of sovereignty? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think the, the answer to lack of, uh, if the domestic government is, is not respecting rights of the domestic citizens, that doesn't necessarily call for the aid agencies to somehow force the domestic government to respect rights. Because that, like you said, that violates sovereignty. It's, you know, the aid agencies themselves are involved in a sort of coercive imposition of what they think is, is right without adequate knowledge or incentives to get things right without respecting the sovereignty of the aid recipient. So I, I never think, I'm never in favor of kind of coercion by Western media agencies. I think that's a disaster. It leads to a backlash. It's certainly not gonna achieve any kind of political reform. It just adds more coercion into a situation in which there is too much coercion already. Great. Good answer, Bill, good answer. Amna, Amna, Asma, sorry, Asma. Asma, I can't read the last name, sorry. Asma, Alma. Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, uh, so, sir, my question is related to, uh, uh, you know, the foreign aid as a whole. You know, we use this terminology, whereas foreign aid could be humanitarian aid, it can be economic aid to a country, it can be a military aid. I mean, there can be several types of foreign aids with different development or different type of objectives behind it. So, I mean, uh, you know, uh, especially we do criticize donor agencies and, you know, we do say that the donor agencies are not very well coordinated with the government when it comes to development uh, aid and human development. Uh, sir, what do you say about the, the, the type of uh, assistance that come, comes in a country? I mean, how should governments be dealing with different types of foreign aid? I mean, there can be humanitarian, there, it can be economic assistance with so, in form of soft loans uh, to alleviate poverty. It can be refugees, aid related to refugees coming from the neighboring uh, countries. I mean, Pakistan will be probably facing that type of a situation again. Uh, and there might be some donor, you know, or foreign aid, as we say, it's not going to really, you know, improve Pakistan's development uh, uh, context, but it will be targeted to the refugees, you know, as, as we saw like, in the past two decades. Uh, how do our governments should be preparing for this type of a situation when it, the foreign aid, so-called, has different objectives behind it? Uh, it's not necessarily always development of our or that that host country. It could be anything else related to the foreign policy of the neighboring countries or political situation, geopolitical situation, or you know. So, so could you please comment on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asim. Uh, so, you know, I I am not going to comment on on uh, aid to Pakistan because this, this audience knows you know much more about that than I do. I think we can comment on, we can discuss kind of what are the general results in the empirical literature on aid, which, which do differentiate, as you said, between different types of aid, like humanitarian aid versus other types of aid. And humanitarian aid probably has the best reputation of any sector in aid because it's going directly to alleviate you know, severe tragedy in terms of famines or violence. Unfortunately, the same literature that found that food aid can increase violence also found that humanitarian aid can increase violence when it goes into a, an environment that is already, already violent, 
like Afghanistan. So, you know, no kind of aid like humanitarian aid gets a, a free pass. We always, the donors have to always ask is, is aid being going into a situation where it's, it's going to lead to more violence, more rights violations, and, you know, where aid is not going to reach the people that it's supposed to reach. That's always the question we need to ask about any type of aid and, and look at the evidence and look at the, the, the theory and the evidence. I think one thing that the lady was trying to get at, Bill, is the case of Pakistan, for example, where you had every time US comes into Afghanistan, our aid goes up. Every time US goes out, our aid comes down. And uh, we've gone through the cycle twice and likely to go through it the third time. And uh, that all that means is it destabilizes the government, it kind of forces the government to behave in a certain way because of US foreign policy. At the same time, the war spills into us and we suffer as well. Um, I know it's not a question, but go ahead if you want to comment. No, uh, Nadim, I, I mean, I think you're saying it much more eloquently than I, than I could, that the US aid is serving the interests of US foreign policy, not the interests of Pakistani recipients. Well, you can see on the chart that this is the way it's behaved. So anyway, let's go to um, the last question. Shahid, Shahid Mahmood, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Isfiti. It was a pleasure listening to you. Uh, very nice talk. I'm Shahid Mahmood, uh, research fellow at PIDE. I'm an economist. Uh, I'll begin with a short, a short joke. You might, you and Dr. Nadeem might enjoy it. And then uh, just a few observations. Uh, so I'll be uh, quick. Uh, the first, the joke. Uh, I was working at a government institution in Pakistan, and there was this bureaucrat who, who was about to retire. He will, it, he was only three months away from retirement, and he was sent to capacity building uh, at Harvard just three months prior to his retirement. So, and the donor seemed to be very okay with it. They never objected to it. So that's uh, uh, that's the joke. I don't know if you would enjoy it or not. Uh, and okay, and now, the, yeah. And uh, now the question. Uh, it's interesting that you uh, gave the example of a few countries like uh, uh, one African country is exporting flowers to uh, Netherlands without the intervention of any government, and just to. It was work of research. So where does that leave central planning in your thoughts about central planning, the role of central planning in economic development? And now the reason that I am asking this question is that central planning is a big thing in Pakistan. Uh, we have a top-down approach, uh, which means that at, uh, it's uh, all our annual plans and central plans are designed, uh, the public investment plans are designed by bureaucracy and they are approved at that level, at higher level. It's a top down uh, with a lot of political intervention. And a big part of that central planning is the brick and mortar development approach because it's all about building roads, it's all about building highways, uh, buildings, and uh, uh, and these kind of things. So uh, where where do you see the role of central that kind of planning in development in economic growth? Yeah, thanks Shahid, that's a great question. I think. Um... Central planning used to be very popular in develop, development economics, and I think it was, it was frankly inspired by the example of, of Soviet central planning, which for a time seemed to be successful at increasing Soviet industrialization and economic growth in the 30s through the 1950s. Uh, of course, we now know from the Soviet history that, that there's enormous amounts of violence and rights violations going on in, in that case. Obviously, what you're talking about is a much more mild, less violent kind of central planning. It still suffers from the, the, the fundamental flaw of central planning that the planners never have enough knowledge to know what, what really is going to work. And that's the advantage of markets is markets reward actually what the surprises that do work in practice and doesn't require that the, the central planners have to have an impossible amount of knowledge to make things work. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, Bill. This is wonderful. Let me just quickly close by just asking you a couple of small questions. One is, uh, Bill, um, the development, I mean, we did a webinar, for example, let me back up. We did a webinar with Gustav Papanek, who is kind of the father of aid in Pakistan. You might remember him. Yeah, we still yeah. did a webinar with him, and it was very interesting wow. to hear about how he came to Pakistan and slowly, because of the lack of uh, interest or things here. He took over policy and he made the planning commission. He even made the DID. Now, mm -hmm. the question is that the development bureaucracy has grown hugely since then. 
Then the development bureaucracy of Gustav Wappenek, and that's about it. And a few other people maybe joined him now and again. But now the development bureaucracy is huge. You can see how the World Bank has grown in our lifetime. You can see the, how the IMF and other agencies, and so many other agencies are coming into shape all the time. So Fahim's um, thesis that, look, there are so many agencies that I know, I dealt with them, and it's a, it's a pain. I mean, we don't have the number of people to deal with them. I remember when the flood in 2010 came here, there was a room in which all the donors came in. There was no room to put in any Pakistanis. I had to be there alone with 100 people because they, were, they brought in 100 people, and we didn't have room to put in more people. So another question that I have for you is, and we discussed the question of who our government is answerable to. And the Dombasi Mayo thesis says that the, the dead aid thesis that the government is responsible to donors. And we also feel this way that the government is responsible to the donors. They have no responsibility to us. They respond to the donors, their accountability is there. But the question that I have for you is, does the development bureaucracy now have a living will of its own? Does it want to continue to kind of continue itself? And related to that is the issue of these consultants that sit in the beltway. The Kemonics and the development alternatives, and, you know, various consultants who do nothing else but consult for aid. They've got, they've got projects worth 100, I've looked at their projects, they have $1.8 billion worth of projects with USA, $2.8 billion with the World Bank, but they don't have any private sector consulting, they only work with these guys. So there's a whole ethos or a whole structure of development that's come around aid, and they are so powerful that I remember even as, as uh, our prime minister, when he tries to talk, for example, we have had this issue where we are trying to get rid of some of these people and they fight back, their ambassadors and the foreign policy, everything comes back. So this development bureaucracy wants to live and wants to carve out a creeping mission for itself. Um, do you see it that way or am I being too uh, morose? Well, I'm, I, I'm pretty skeptical too, as you know. <laughs> I mean, again, we, we want to try as much as possible to take things out of the realm of emotion and just look as economists, what are the incentives of the actors? So, you know, the, the development bureaucrats and consultants are not bad people. They're just reacting to incentives. Exactly. You know, their, their incentives are to please the funders. They do, they do not face incentives that reward success or penalize failure. So, you know, as you said, the bureaucracy can keep growing even though the bureaucracy is failing to deliver development successes. Mm -hmm. So with, with those incentives, uh, what you just described is, is kind of explained why, why it's happening. So the problem again is too much reliance on, on aid bureaucrats and not, not enough reliance on the homegrown efforts of, of the recipients themselves. And I remember a poem which you might also remember which was written way back in the 70s or 80s, which said, I have my packed ba bags packed and I'm catching a plane and I'm going to go and consult, et cetera. I, this has now become far more intense than it used to be in those days. So yeah. there's a huge problem. But now the last question that I want to pose to you, which well, is- very I, I used to be one of those too, so I, I feel a little oh, bit right. guilty about that. <laughs> I remember many a time sitting in a hotel room with my mission in, from the fund and discussing, right. what are we doing here? Why are we, why are we out to tell, give these guys advice when we've only been here two weeks in a high start? Exactly. So, last question that I have for you is, Bill. All this is happening. This is the most speculative out of your realm, or my realm too, but it's worth talking about. All this is happening in the midst of rapidly changing technology and the COVID um, pandemic. The question is, even as we speak, technology is kind of going to put our labor intensive economy out of business. We were always concerned about labor intensive and our labor to export our labor. We live on our remittances. How do you see? I mean, just speculate. I know I'm putting you on the spot. With this technology, where do you think we're going? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you gave me an opportunity to be optimistic when, uh, when you're pessimistic. <laughs> I'm not, I'm more optimistic about the the trend towards automation or robots or whatever. I mean, no, you know, nobody is forced to use robots. I think the, you know, the, the incentives are still very much in, in favor of labor intensive, labor intensive industries. You know, our, my, my, the way I kind of read economics 101 is that when, when labor is, when wages are low and labor is abundant, then, you know, producers want to use a lot of labor. And, 
you know, that, that's more rational than using robots when labor is abundant. So I, I don't think that, I don't really buy into this pessimistic story that robots are gonna kind of destroy labor intensive industries. Okay, great. It's good to end on an optimistic note, but if you have time, I'll take one more question. This young man is insisting if you have time. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, good. Ali, go ahead. All right. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you, for, uh, Professor uh, Israeli. This is great. I discovered you through uh, Nassim Talib, and you know he's he has colorful things to say about top-down governance. Um, yeah. yes. so my question is: um, the ex-Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis, in his book *The Global Minotaur*, he uh, presented a very compelling narrative of how IMF played an integral role in the post-World War II recovery in Europe and Japan. Um, and to borrow from uh, Carol Quigley, uh, it could be said that IMF or World Bank at that time, they served as instruments of expansion of the uh, Western free market paradigm. But um, now it seems that it has ossified into an institution that exists mainly to serve itself, you know, as he goes on in the evolution of civilizations. Now, uh, for you, as someone who's been in the thick of it for such a long time, do you think that another instrument of expansion of the uh, you know, development paradigm is emerging in the West? Or do you think that there is too strong a symbiotic relationship between aid and deprivation that the only way forward is for the entire institution to collapse? Yeah, so uh, I think I have a more favorable view of a free market approach to development than, than what you're expressing. I'm glad we're having that discussion. Uh, but I, I don't think, uh, and it's true that World Bank and IMF economists have also sometimes advocated a more free market view. But I, and I myself used to be one of those World Bank economists advocating that. But I, I don't think our efforts were that constructive because I, I think the perception was we're, like you said, we're sort of forcing our free market views on, on, on the recipients of aid and structural adjustment lending. And that's not the answer. The answer is always, you know, freedom of sovereignty and freedom of choice of the recipients. That it's up to them to decide what policies and and uh, approaches they want to pursue in development. I don't think that foreign coercion by for the experts yes. coercing the recipients to do what the experts think is best is is correct. Even when the experts are are correct, even when the expert advice is correct. Uh, coercion is still not the answer. It's still going to backfire and just lead to uh, a backlash against that advice. So it's which, in fact, happened with structural adjustment that led to kind of an anti-market turn in Latin America and Africa for a while. So the answer is always homegrown sovereignty and freedom of choice, both collectively and individually. Freedom, political and economic rights, is, is always the answer, in my view. Expert coercion is never the answer. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, very good. And uh, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. There'll be a lot of debate here in Pakistan. We are still torn between the planner's model and we still don't accept the searcher. The market we are still very suspicious of, but this is a colonial tradition that we live with. We are British colonials and that thought continues to stay with us. Perhaps after my generation it might change, but we are still in charge and therefore this is still going on. Thank you very much for taking out the time. We'll bother you now and again to help us think our way through uh, the morass of economic policy and development. Thank you, Ben. Thank all you, Nadim. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. So I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.